Hi everyone, welcome and thanks for tuning in to this first Breakfast Bite on Digital Citizenship. I'm Elizabeth, mother of two rebel girls and director of Coffee Families Europe. And I'll be hosting this Breakfast Bite with Isabel, who is a basketball fan, penguin lover and our communication officer at Coffee. Hi everyone. Um, so you might have recognized that you can't, uh, or we can't see or hear you, but you can hear and see us. But as many of you already saw, you, we have enabled the chat. So we invite you to say hello in the chat, also to everyone, if you want, of course. Um, be sure to uh, select all panelists and attendees. Um, and yeah, you can, for example, say also your name, the country or the organization that you work for. And um, for now, we would like to try a poll to also see who is here. So I will launch a poll and invite you to uh, take part in the poll. It's just taking like one minute or something. Um, okay, I just launched it. I hope you can see it. The question is simple. How would you describe yourself or organization? And it's anonymous. Okay. So give us an idea of who's, who's listening in, profile. And if you don't recognize yourself in there, I'm sorry. We only had a limited number of options. And, you know, if you come from a completely different sector or background, please, you know, express it in the, the chat. Okay, yeah. Can you see the answers coming in? We can see the answers coming in. No, yeah. I can't. Uh -huh. <laughs> You'll see in a second. Yeah. Okay, we're nearly there. Nearly everyone's voted. We'll give you maybe a couple more seconds. So who hasn't voted yet? Just we invite you to vote and then we share the results. Yeah, and of course, as new panelists come in, they're not, okay, uh, sorry, as new, new attendees come in, yeah, we'll never reach the full because yeah, that's true. we're reaching 100, 100 attendees. But shall we, shall we? Yeah, let's, oh. I will end the poll and then uh, share the results with you. So mm -hmm. you can see we have a broad spectrum and people from different drum areas. Roll, drum roll, yeah. Drum roll. <laughs> yeah, a lot of NGOs and teachers. Cool. So we have, yeah, quite a mix. Okay. Well, quite a mix of digital citizens and from the chats, clearly also from very different corners of Europe. So that's great. Uh, in case you haven't seen, um, well, to kick off this webinar series, we sent the video of the executive vice president, uh, Vesteya, uh, to all of you via email. It's also on our website and on social media. On behalf of Professor Families Europe, let me extend a big thank you to the Executive Vice President for her support and her tireless work to build a, a digital Europe that works for society. This is uh, very much appreciated. Now, before starting, Isabel, do you want to give any tips to the participants and panelists? Yes. So just for you to have the best experience, we recommend to be close to your Wi-Fi wi router, if possible. Then, of course, have your favorite tea drink like for me it's tea um, but it can be water coffee um, when you have questions please post the questions for the panelists in the Q&A um, the questions will be monitored and the panelists uh, can then answer the questions if you have any other questions not really related uh, to the content and uh, you can also send it to us privately team Kofasa if it's more technical related and yeah, and please also, if you spread the word during this webinar, um, do that on all social media channels, Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And we usually use the hashtag digital families EU if you want. Um, okay, I think that's all. Um, I think we can go. Great. So for the first of our digital citizenship bites, um, we're going to focus on the concept of digital citizenship itself myth or reality. 
So we have for this uh, two speakers. We have Martin Schmoltzweet, who is new dad in lockdown and senior policy and advocacy manager of Covasay Families Europe. And we have Andrea Parola, who is an Italian dad in lockdown and coordinator of the ICT Industry Coalition for Children Online. So thanks for joining us. Now, Martin, is it correct to say, I think you want to launch a few polls before starting to get the temperature out there, yeah? Right, we're going to ask you to vote again. The first one is this. Do social media platforms have to protect your right to free speech? What is your feeling there? Yes, no, maybe, no idea. This is one of the things that Martin is going to touch upon in his presentation. I think he wants to get an idea of where you all stand. Okay, a few more minutes, the votes are coming in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. Right. Couple more votes. No. Okay, let's go for it. So, Martin, what do you think? Very interesting. Very interesting finding, and I'll I'll touch upon um, <clears throat> I'll comment on that result. Okay. Right. Second poll. Do you feel confident that in case you experience a major problem online, like your data being stolen or falling prey to extortion, that public authorities in your country will be able to successfully intervene? Oof, okay. A couple of yeses coming in. <laughs> Very important question. Very. And we'll see why later. <clears throat> Hey, and hello to everybody else who joined us, by the way, from Greece and Bulgaria. Um, you're very welcome. So a few more votes. By the way, these are all anonymous polls, just to be clear. Buongiorno Sicilia. Right, I think we'll end the polling and publish. Ah, very interesting again. <clears throat> Hmm. Yeah, definite majority saying yes. no. Yes. Ah, yeah. Right. Last poll. Here we go. That's really informative. Did you ever vote or participate in any way in drafting the terms of reference of the online services you use? Trick question. <laughs> Well, believe it or not, a few yeses. Wow. Uh, yeah, you can't see the polls. Uh, yeah, they should show up on your, on your screen. For the few yeses, I'd like the testimony in the chat of which services those were. <laughs> well, we can do that after. All right. Great. Okay. Right. Well, that gives you an idea of the temperature and area. I think I'll see if we can sort that out for you. Yeah. While Martin is speaking. Right. Martin, take it away. Uh, All right. So if you can share my, my presentation. Uh, so I'm going to do a share screen right now. <clears throat> and here we go. Voila. How's that? that Perfect. Okay? Yeah. Yep. So digital citizenship, myth or reality? Now, obviously, um, that was the, um, the name of this session, <clears throat> which is a bit of a clickbait, obviously, just to get people um, fired up. Um, but you can, you can go uh, to the first slide. <clears throat> 
So um, beyond the, the clickbait title, um, what's really important is, first of all, to decide what is a digital citizenship. And uh, there are many definitions out there. Uh, I've participated in the, digital count, uh, the Council of Europe's uh, expert group, along with other experts, to helping define what a digital citizenship is. Um, but, you know, I've always been uh, a bit critical of describing the features of, of a digital citizenship, even if they're accurate, in, uh, in the present day to what it actually is. So I always compare that to like saying uh, what the features of a car are without describing what the car is actually. Um, <clears throat> and so we talk about different features like online safety, digital skills, active participation, but we don't actually define the terms. Um, and so here um, I'd like to go back to revisit uh, citizenship as a term because that's the most misunderstood and you can see the illustration that I used is from uh, Thomas Hobbes, the political thinker, uh, the Leviathan. <clears throat> um, and by the way, uh, full disclosure, I'm, I'm a background in political science. So this, uh, this presentation will be probably uh, half political science-y um, <clears throat> and theoretical, but uh, sorry for that. I think it's really important. So the point is uh, citizenship, uh, to have citizenship, first of all, you need to have sovereignty of a people over a certain territory. That's how it all starts. So that's how our nation states emerged. You first have to have uh, sovereignty over your land and people that feel and share that they have a common sort of destiny. And then citizenship is an exclusive right. So an exclusive meaning that there's some people are citizens, other people are not citizens, granted by an institution like the government, which is created by the will of the people, at least in our representative democracies. And that is called a social contract in, um, in political science terms, meaning you forfeit certain uh, of your um, rights, for instance, the right to, um, um, to um, deliver justice on your own. So for instance, if uh, the neighbor does something to you, you don't uh, punch him back in the face. Uh, you go to the courts and, and they settle it uh, via that way or the right to rebel or plenty of other rights. But the features, the features of the citizenship vary greatly from political system to political system. For instance, you wouldn't say that a Chinese citizen or a uh, Russian citizen or a French citizen or a, a US citizen have exactly the same citizenship rights. And that's really important to understand that citizenship is very dependent on which political system you're living under and the country you're living in. Um, so that's the first thing I, I really wanted to clear out there. And uh, this idea of being an exclusive right is also very important because when you add digital to citizenship, then obviously the first precondition to be a digital citizen is to have access to the internet. So there already, if you don't have access to the internet, you're not a digital citizen, you're a di digital non-citizen or an analog citizen for that matter. Um, so that's the, the first thing. And then there's all kinds of other preconditions for being a digital citizen, like having the right skills, because if you don't have the right skills, then you're, you're kind of like a second class um, digital citizen. Uh, so can you go to the next slide? I most certainly can. Yeah. yeah. So digital, when we talk about digital citizenship, there's certain, uh, a certain overlapping with analog citizenship. So you can think of cyberspace or, or the internet as a kind of a virgin, sort of a virgin territory. I put that in a question mark because it's not really the case, but in theory, you could imagine it as, you know, like the United States when in, in the beginning, you know, you had swaths of land that were quote unquote free, of course, uh, that didn't belong to anyone. Of course, that's kind of belonged to the Indians, but okay, let's imagine that you have a piece of land that belongs to no one. And then, you know, just whoever, uh, wants to settles there and then there's a local sheriff that uh, applies whatever law is within that little community which is sometimes completely different from uh, the law in other places and so if we think of the internet as a sort of a cyberspace where you project yourself like, like uh, when you go to a, um, a foreign country basically when you're traveling then your citizenship status from your country a little permeates a little bit into the country you're visiting, depending on plenty of different conditions. Um, and it, it is a bit like that with the internet. So when you go um, and um, you become a member, for instance, of a social network online, you open an account somewhere, there's a form of bond that is created between you and that service or that virtual space. 
Um, but whether you're an actual citizen, that is less obvious. Um, often in many of those spaces, because they're privately owned, um, then um, you're not so much a citizen, but more of a subject, subject to the terms and services. And then certain of your, some of your rights just permeate into the online space. Like for instance, the GDPR in the case of Europe, but there's also plenty of other laws from the US. Um, so the, 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 the question to ask, for instance, when you're trying to decide whether you're a digital citizen in the services that you use is precisely those questions that we asked. Like, did you vote for the terms and services um, of the services that you, uh, the online services that you use, for instance, did we, did we vote for Mark Zuckerberg to be at the head of Facebook? And did we vote on the terms of services of that particular platform or of Twitter or of Google? Um, or do they just send an update of the new terms and services, which have to abide by uh, certain rules, of course, um, but are still drafted uh, from the point of view of a private company? And so it's more like you have virtual kingdoms, which are those online spaces that uh, where you are subject to the king, which exist within the framework of a representative democracies in the real world or plenty of other um, uh, types of um, political systems. And so there are many different uh, digital citizenships on top of the idealized and formalized ones. So you have the features of digital citizenship um, as they would be in, in an ideal world with all the features, and you can go and, and see what the uh, Council of Europe has to say about that. Um, and then you have, in practice, uh, depending on the online services that you join, whether those are actually realized or, or operationalized uh, on the services that you use. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> And so it's, it's more when you are a digital citizen, uh, very often you're a second class uh, citizen online. Uh, and here I'll revisit again uh, a little bit of theory, the Roman versus Greek citizenship. Um, in the Roman citizenship, um, people that were conquered by the Roman Empire were subject to Roman law, but they had no right to vote or part participate. So they were citizens, they were officially Roman citizens and they could go to court, they had a certain number of rights, but they couldn't vote and participate, which was actually one of the, what is, which is one of the most important ones actually. <clears throat> um, then in ancient Greece, it's the complete opposite. When you had the, the uh, privilege of being a citizen, which was about like, I don't know, 10 or 15% of the population, you have to be male, of course, and you have to be Greek born. But still, when you were uh, a citizen, then being a citizen was all that you were doing. It was actually a duty. You had to participate. You had to actually take turns in ruling um, in, uh, uh, and going from institution to institution. So there, your, 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 uh, the, the, the time that you devoted to being a citizen and actually um, uh, participate in the, in the governing um, process was 100%. You didn't have a time to be a businessman. You didn't have a time to be a merchant or a peasant. Uh, being a citizen was a full-time job. And between those two extremes, there is a wide kind of spectrum of um, citizenships and, um, and uh, where, where your, your obligations and your rights kind of stand. Um, so in, in uh, Greek times, we're pretty extreme, but um, here in our representative democracies, too often it translates into uh, every five years you vote for people and then it's kind of hands off, you go about your business, you do your life, uh, and then hopefully those people that you elected are going to uh, represent you as a citizen in a correct way and make sure that the rights and regulations and all of that are, um, are, um, are in the best uh, of your interest. So to give you an example online, for instance, when you visit a public website like uh, your official uh, government administration, your status there as a citizen is exactly the same as offline. So you have the same rights, uh, you have the same uh, free speech, you have all, all, the, all the same protections. Then when you go to private spaces, then it changes a little bit. And if you want to go to the most extreme, for instance, if you visit uh, the dark web, for instance, um, chances are you, um, you don't have any rights at all <laughs> or that your rights will never be enforced, uh, which is uh, kind of the same thing. Um, and, and also it depends which country you're living in. 
Because if you're lucky enough to be a citizen in a powerful country like the US or the EU, then uh, it is likely that um, your rights will be enforced online uh, and um, onto private services in a much more uh, stringent way than if you live in a weak third world country. Like in the EU, we have the GDPR, but the GDPR applies to Europe. If you live in Iran or if you live in, uh, I don't know, Venezuela or countries where you have almost uh, Venezuela, we have almost no enforcement and the government is on near uh, shutdown, or if you live in very weak states, then uh, the experience that you have in um, having your offline rights permeate online is completely different. Even though many online services, of course, apply the same uh, kind of, at least some same uh, principles in terms of service across the board, but still uh, the GDPR, for instance, doesn't apply outside of Europe. So. <clears throat> Um, so yeah, I think, um, you can go to the next slide. Oh no, wait a minute. Um, back down, back up. Back one. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. So I just wanted to say on this, um, you know, dictatorship is, is, um, this Kodush Kodush used to say, a French comedian used to say, a dictatorship is shut up and democracy is keep talking. No one cares. So. Here, I want to really insist on the importance of participation and active participation in, um, in the process of citizenship as we understand it in uh, representative democracies. Because of course, if you're in a country where you don't even have the right to vote for uh, your president or your, your who's ruling you, then, you know, I mean, your own off online experience will be probably the same. But um, so if you don't have the right to vote, for um, for uh, the services that you use, then uh, you're not really in a in a kind of a kind of a democratic sphere. Um, what does it actually mean? Um, uh, does it mean, for instance, to active participation? What does it mean? Does it mean to freely voice your opinion online? Is that all it means? Or does it mean to actually affect the services you're using? Or does it mean to vote on how uh, social networks moderate content? Um, so that's that's a really important question to ask, uh, and um, on that uh, poll, actually, the answer is um, private uh, companies have no obligation to protect your free speech unless they're deemed of being uh, vital to the public debate and have a, like a public kind of dimension to it. But ultimately, it's, it's, if it's a private space, then um, they have the right to take down things um, um, on a whim if they want to. The, th the reason they don't do it is because uh, they would probably take a lot, lot of flack and uh, pressure from, um, you know, governments and the public for not doing so. But ultimately, they remain uh, the sole ones to decide what stays and what goes. Uh, and we've seen examples, for instance, of things like nudity, for instance, where certain paintings were taken down, certain pieces of art under the, the term of nudity. Um, where people were defending free speech on the one hand, and on the other hand, people were saying, well, no, it's offensive content. But um, ultimately, the answer is for private services, they have no obligation to protect your free speech. Free speech is protected when you are in the public sphere. Um, <clears throat> so, for instance, outside on the street. But if you're in your home you can, and somebody's saying something you don't like, you can and gently say, please leave my home, house. <laughs> That's the principle. So um, interesting for you to know then, because um, it seems many of you thought that um, uh, they had to predict free speech, but no, it's, it's more of a sort of a thing that they do so they don't look bad in the eyes of the, the, the public and governments. Um, and so it's difficult to find uh, traces of, of actual active participation online. Um, um, Unless you know you, you look at public consultations, like the EU Commission does public consultations online, or your local government is going to do public consultations, or rare self-governed online communities, like I'm thinking of Mastodon, for instance, the decentralized social network, where there is this kind of kind of uh, self uh, self governance uh, features included. But it's really hard to find uh, examples of real, active, democratic, active participation uh, in the online space. So I'm not going to go into the whole um, uh, ICANN thing and look at how, uh, in detail, how the offline and online uh, dimensions and enforcement kind of permeate, 
because there's so many layers. There's the role of the ISPs, the internet service providers. There's the role of ICANN and institutions that assign domain names and, and that can block certain uh, websites. Uh, so it's a whole can of worms there. But you have to understand that it's really, really complex, uh, this kind of permeation of online and, and, and offline. Uh, and especially with the poll, like, do you feel confident that your government can uh, enforce or help you if you have a problem, if you suffer from extortion online? Um, the answer to that is is less than obvious, actually. It's it's much more difficult than you might think to actually have redress if you are uh, been stolen data or if you've been um, a victim of extortion, unless there's some um, a real uh, big, like if it's a part of something like uh, child abuse material where there is a real big task force and dedicated um, um, dedicated um, uh, efforts, coordinated efforts and in international efforts to take down those kind of contents and investigate, um, you have about as much uh, likelihood to be uh, enforced, to have your rights, rights enforced and have some follow-up on your, on your problems as when you're, if, if you walk up to the police station and say you've been abducted by aliens and ask them to investigate that. Um, like last slide and I'll finish, I, I'm conscious of time. You're doing great. Um, we're good. So decentralization, real digital citizenship. And there, there is a little question mark. Maybe it's obscured by uh, my face actually, but there is a question mark there. So public blockchain technology um, might, because, you know, um, ultimately the infrastructure behind the internet is decentralized, meaning it's very resilient. Um, it's very hard to censor and information can flow through the infrastructure and the internet uh, in, a, in a way that is almost impossible to block. But the web, so the content part is highly centralized. You have big data ser servers that are in certain countries where uh, all of the content is hosted or most of it. Um, and that can be then easily controlled or censored or much more easily than uh, the infrastructure itself. But public blockchain technology might build a decentralized cyberspace that is run by people directly on top, uh, running alongside um, the um, internet infrastructure. And so, you know, you might think of it as basically you have a computer at your house that is running 24 seven that has a two or three terabytes hard drive that you rent out to anyone who wants to host content. Um, and you also rent out uh, um, content um, or space uh, from other people around the, the internet so that your data is protected. It's not only stored on your hard drive and is highly resilient to uh, failures. But there are key implications to that kind of infrastructure coming online. First of all, the, imp the implications of no more censorship. Imagine an internet where it's impossible to take down content, impossible to even take down a link towards uh, uh, a content that is illegal or problematic. And um, that begs the question of what kind of governance we should set up on top of this emerging infrastructure to address this, this, um, this, this, uh, and the implication of that technology, which might create a non-censorable internet. Um, another question is, are people ready for proactive participation in our representative democracies where we're just asking people to pay attention to politics for about two months before the elections and vote and then go about their lives? Are we ready for an, an internet coming online where people actually have to take an interest on who's running it, how it is being run, uh, trying to see and, and, and trying to decide um, which uh, technology they're going to support, which competing uh, technology in the blockchain space they're going to support, which has a governance, um, a governance kind of uh, policy which they support, which is uh, democratic or, or is uh, more open. Um, how will this technology affect offline citizenship? For instance, when governments, re uh, governments uh, realize that they cannot affect uh, or, or uh, influence uh, the, the, these technologies that cannot censor it, they cannot um, block it. Um, how will that work? You know, how, how, will, be, how will they influence each other? Um, when we trans transition to collective and shared responsibility, where it's impossible to point out who's to blame, for instance, today, if um, a Facebook hosts uh, or, or Amazon Cloud or Google, if they um, host highly legal content, they are liable in front of the law. You can actually pinpoint responsibility towards someone and make sure you have redress. But in, 
in a world where you don't even know who's hosting the data because it is broken up in tiny chunks and encrypted and uh, sent on thousands and thousands of people hard drives around the world. Um, and it's just run by an actual um, uh, um, program that is decentralized, it's running online on, on people's computers. Who do you send a subpoena to? Who do you send uh, 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 a, um, a request to uh, take down contents to? So are legal systems ready for that? Um, but then again, maybe this, this new kind of technology is coming online also as a backstop to the temptation of a joint kind of public-private surveillance capitalism, which is something that we're seeing even more likely to emerge out of this uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus crisis, where now we're trying to see if, if these big giant public services, uh, uh, private services like Google, Facebook cannot work hand in hand with governments, governments to uh, trace people and follow where they're going and all that. And this might be in a public interest now, but the potential for abuse of, um, of, um, of that kind of situation for non-public um, uh, interest um, uh, aims is very high. And <clears throat> we've already seen um, uh, tensions and, and um, strains on democratic rights across the country, uh, across the world, and plenty of different, um, <clears throat> plenty of different countries, uh, where you know governments uh, take spe take on special powers and all that, and um, that is a worrying trend, and we should really keep an eye out out for that. And maybe maybe this infrastructure. This new technology is also an answer to make sure that that doesn't happen, a sort of an alternative uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen. So that's it for me. Um, you can go to the last slide. Um, you know, uh, happy to answer questions and uh, you can uh, reach me via the email, not via the phone because obviously I'm confined at the moment, but uh, there you have it. Thank you, Martin. All right, let me... or not. Um, look, there are a few questions already in the Q&A, but I think if you agree, uh, we'll take them after Andrea's presentation. Um, I think there's a lot in there, and I have loads of questions myself. Andrea. Yes, do you first want of all, to... uh, don't show my slide, because oh. I will react uh, partially to what Martin say, and I did not see the presentation before, so I rather think it could be interesting. Sure, uh, take from no there. worries. So Sounds for those good. who know me, my name is Andrea Parola and I'm the general manager of an association called ICT Coalition for Children Online, which is around 20 companies coming together to try to make sure that the internet is a safer place uh, for children. Uh, membership is quite broad. We range from some of the company Martin mentioned, so Facebook, Google, Twitter, TikTok, to companies like Ubo, Deutsche Telekom, Vodafone, Telefonica. So it's a quite interesting variety. And yes, most of them are big companies. Also Disney is there. Uh, I mean, let's start from, I'm a political scientist as well. So some of the things Martin say, make a few clicks, uh, even though I need to speak from a perspective of industry here today. And when it comes to citizenship, so what does it mean to be a digital citizenship? For industry, traditionally, a beginning was ensuring protection. And Martin mentioned briefly, but there are two strict illegal uh, content, which is online, which is protection of uh, uh, copyright, so copyright infringement, and protection of minors. So everything which was protection of minors, that's how citizen, digital citizenship started. So companies want to make sure that there were not illegal content on their uh, product and services. But we are speaking about quite uh, a few years ago where internet was just, uh, I would say, I would just few websites accessing some information and it was now uh, digital. We didn't speak about digital society at the time. I remember one of the things were was information society media, something like that. Uh, and I think some of the problem that we had at the time also, what we have now, what does it mean to have access? You have, I mean, I think at the top of my mind, find element which makes access to internet, which is about infrastructure. So with so many people today at home, you can see that people are appreciating to have a high reliable speed uh, connection. 
and uh, also we can because thank today you have a webinar for instance and by the way we have more than 100 participants for those who are uh, listening today uh, you have digital skills so you have much more sophisticated services which are available uh, how you deal with them how you can access and how you can protect yourself so digital skills is part of the component of access then how we sure that people, some category of people have disability, how we sure that the website and digital world, it's made in a way that they can access easily without any problem. Cost is another problem of access. So it's not only cost in terms of equipment, but uh, monthly subscriptions to be part of it. How you can be sure that we don't have a part of our society which is excluded because they cannot afford. Uh, and then at the time was uh, an example of elderly people which were not use it then now you can see that for instance i make obviously this example recently but my mother discovered whatsapp and emoji and she printed out 250 emojis so sometimes she used faces and a sign that i have no clue what it's about so i need to go and search myself uh, but uh, go back to the uh, topic citizenship is that when you access nobody check if you belong to any country you just access internet and you go through it so members here are trying to be sure that when you go through internet, through the sorry, product and services, you have a safe experience as much as possible. Uh, therefore, they have initiatives that are directly of your third party, to, and I will mention some of them later, where they're trying to be sure that European citizens, because we're speaking about Europe at the stage, but they're, what they're doing is also the part of the world, do not fall under any of the categories. So that the five, four or five categories I mentioned before, they are not excluded by access internet. And why access and now digital is important? I think we discovered much more in the last two months where we were all stuck at home, where thanks to the connectivity, you could speak with your friends, how our kids can do homework, follow schools. We can still continue to contribute to the economy as much as possible and you are not totally disconnected from the rest of the world. It means you can still have a chat, you, you have drinks, you can make friends, still in remote. Uh, so be part of something. Uh, interesting also, you have public authorities which are putting online the possibility to contribute. So, uh, which I remember uh, Martin mentioned Roma or uh, Greek approach. There you have debates in Agora, people can hold in the fora, you can go and vote. Now the moment is done online. And these are done by public authorities. So for instance, for those who live in Belgium and Brussels, now there is all discussion about the new 40 kilometers for uh, bike or uh, routes, who wants, who doesn't want it, how to mean it. And this means that a person from having the rights, let's say that Martin said 2000 years ago to go participate and raise his, he or his concern, at the time was his concern, I'd say now internet giving ability also to people who didn't have a voice 2000 years ago, but even 70 years ago. You remember that in Italy, for instance, the woman voted for the first time in 46, 1946. So it's, uh, and when you vote, for instance, there is no possibility, they don't check if you are a citizen sometimes. They just want to hear your voice when it's possible. Uh, I would say that uh, Com uh, companies taking they take care of the fact, as I say, that you are able to profit as much as possible by all the uh, opportunity offered to digital. So it's, first of all and foremost, is about students and kids learning what to do, how to do and how to defend themselves. They have a different uh, interaction with schools or third parties, teacher associations, also parents associations. And we as a, as a group, as a coalition, what we're trying to do is, for instance, we meet every two months and actually several people in the, I can see participants have been attending what we call the forum and the way to change good practices. So what is working in one country, let's see what the company are doing is working in other country or what NGO are doing in one country, how it could be replicated, uh, how it's possible to alert kids because clearly uh, child safety is not business as usual because every day you have a new product and new services and every day you have a new way of using it. I mean, if you consider that uh, when it was a Paris attack, uh, one of the things they used was a chat of a game, online game, to communicate the terrorists. Who thought about that at the time? Uh, when we go online, I, I tend to disagree when, when Martin calls virtual kingdom. I, I'm sure all companies are law abiding. Uh, I mean, also what is interesting, the concept of free of speech. 
it's different in each country. Uh, in Europe, I make an example. So for instance, if you're in Germany, you may not be able to write on anywhere uh, that uh, Mr. Hitler was a great person. Definitely. You're not able to do it. In Denmark, you need to be allowed to do so. So it's a very extreme question, uh, example I'm making there. But in the, how is conceived the free of expression, for instance, from Denmark to Germany is quite different. And companies to abide that. They cannot have one standard, for instance, for 27 countries in Europe. Uh, so it's also important that in Europe we have a European legislation, then we have a 27 at the moment different legislation on what is a permit allowed and what is not allowed. And what is also allowed and legislation is part of the national culture, national experience, and therefore a company need to also be able to uh, comply with that. Then Martin mentioned that some companies do not allow any kind of nudity. So it could be a poster, could be a beautiful Raphael painting. And this is done to try to share maximum safety. Uh, because when the volume is so high of images, uh, uh, it could be considered an extreme measure, but it's done in the interest of everybody. So it's not possible to see all kinds of images are uploaded. Maybe one day with artificial intelligence, we'll be able to dis make a distinction between hopefully Raffaello and a porno pornographic image. But at the moment, it's just to avoid that there is a maximum safety and that is the general approach. Uh, I know that there have been controversies about it, but the approach at the moment is that. Uh, I'm trying to make it. So yes, also interesting, uh, Mar Martin mentioned GDPR, which is General Data Protection Regulation, which is basically to protect our data. It's applicable into Europe. Uh, but in this Europe is been, um, there's a great opportunity because many companies, for instance, most of the company I mentioned, they ask US to have something similar. Uh, so we were complaining when it came out and still many people complain because it's a complicated legislation to apply, but once it's there, the idea that Europe can have opportunity to lead in the world. Uh, there have been discussion in Europe about e-privacy. I'm not going to there because at the moment everything is suspended, but if Europe managed to get it right, most of uh, companies wanted to have one piece of legislation worldwide, it's easier. So now they are pushing for GDPR or something similar to adopt in the United States. And I think that uh, Europe has now the opportunity is if we think about it, what is the kind of society economy we want in post COVID. Uh, I'm a bit pessimistic. I think that we are going to COVID and the consequences that will stay with us quite long in terms of social and problem, uh, economical uh, destructure. And therefore the European Union has the possibility to think and try to take some initiatives. So if, and I say this if, big if, uh, European legislators came to the conclusion that some of the companies are too big. That's not wrong. If they are abusing, that, that's a problem. I mean, the fun to be, and we are in the past, I remember beginning of the last century, the United States legislator did not hesitate to intervene to protect citizens, to uh, cut companies. So, sorry, cut companies, dismantle companies, apologies. But if I go back to the point of digital citizenship, uh, what is also interesting is that my, I mean, the member are quite variety, but there is an interest from all of them to have as many as possible people who are able to understand what they're doing. So digital skills is the first up most important. And in the slide that will be circulated, you find uh, several examples of what company are doing, as I say, via third party support. So not directly, but with the expert working on that. Uh, and again, it's also trying to, uh, some of the mention here I mentioned is just about students uh, and children, but you have company like DT also, and the same Google, uh, starting work also with, uh, continue to work with elderly people to be sure that when you're out, out of the workplace, you don't become a citizen which is excluded. I'm thinking about all the service of public administration online, voting online, uh, uh, where uh, it's, uh, if you are not, you don't have access. You don't. You are not part anymore. Or I'm thinking about the fact that most of the discounts now are online. Uh, so if you're not able to find safely pay, trust is important uh, dimension. If you're not able to do it, you are just excluded, and that's not tolerable. 
uh, last point it's uh, I will say that I wish I had a Martin knowledge on blockchain. I'm a bit scared about it sometimes. I understand half of it. And uh, I, I'm not sure that every, I mean, knowledge here, it comes very important. I remember some discussion about internet governance uh, became public. And you have people speak about football, uh, internet governance, like, and now they speak about COVID-19. And I fear that we need to work about general principle, how internet should be, how digital should be. But the technicality, I rather prefer to leave to expert. And I, I'm a naive guy, but I trust the Commission, uh, European Commission on that, the legislators. Uh, because I think that it's uh, very, very easy to uh, use some of this discussion by country like, uh, we mentioned China, which is not the most open country on the internet, or, or Iran, and try to bring uh, to close it even more so, I mean, people spoke about balkanization of internet uh, in some discussion ITU. And this is where basically you have the opposite of digital citizenship. So that's where internet is used to persecute, to find and persecute those who don't think according to the line of the regime, which is basically the opposite of this point. While the internet offers a great, great tool to participate, to manifest their dissent, to be also in, uh, creativity, and when internet is closed down using uh, argument like uh, the one made in some of those countries, I think we are going the opposite of what we're doing now. Uh, let me also stress my last point is that uh, all companies, I mean, at least all companies of the ICT coalition respect the law and abide to the law. And the term of use sometimes are more stringent uh, than the law. It's true that, I mean, it's true that sometimes people may understand why I need to do that. Uh, most of the time I've done it, first of all, to comply with different legislations. So when you click thermal reference, it's very long legalistic uh, piece of note that you need to agree with. And there it's, I think it's more than voting, it's similar to signing a contract. Uh, why, I'm not sure you can, because that's one of the questions, I'm not sure you can define voting as a contract between you and your MP. Uh, but happy to discuss about it. And some of the terms of reference I use are be sure that the service can function properly, that the user are, sorry, the user are protected, the service are uh, function properly, and the user uh, that can proactively eventually flag content most of the time and say, we don't like this. And, but we need to be sure that if it's not a revenge, so if really there's a concern about the piece of content, because many of the uh, a company receive a lot of flagging and uh, which are not really relevant because of the content is revenge, is PT uh, discussions. So we need to also be sure why and what content is uh, flagged. Clearly, there is no place for child pornography at all. Uh, and also most of the well, none of the company, uh, the ICT Commission has problems with pornography. Uh, and I think I can stop here so we can have some questions. Thank you very much, Andrea. Martin, I wonder, do you want to react briefly on what Andrea has said before we, we look at the Q&A? Yeah, I mean, first of all, sorry, Andrea. <laughs> I, I actually finalized my presentation yesterday evening. Um, so, but thanks uh, for the, the great feedback. Um, I mean, I, I guess I'd just like to stress, well, I've, of course, when I use the term like kingdom, it's more uh, provocative than, uh, than uh, to be taken literally. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I just wanted to stress that there's a clear difference between the relationship between you and your government, your public institutions, and the relationship between you and the online services that you use. Um, and when we use the, the, the term digital citizenship to describe that relationship between you and those online services, it is sometimes misplaced and people have the wrong ideas about what it actually means. So that's the one thing that I really wanted to stress and clarify. Uh, even though you can use, for instance, Facebook for uh, enhancing your citizenship um, by, you know, I mean, debating, uh, having political debates and voicing your opinion and plenty of other things, um, it's important to have a distinction between the relationship between you and your governments, you and the service and all those things. And uh, th the other thing that I wanted to stress is, of course, enforcement. So uh, it's true that um, services like uh, Facebook or Google, they don't bother to have 
a uh, hundred different terms of service that are customized to the country so they can extract more profit from people in, I don't know, Afghanistan than, than Belgium. Uh, even though I do think they adapt somewhat uh, to certain national um, requirements, like, uh, for instance, Copa greatly influenced Facebook's decision to have that cutoff age at 13. Um, and then if the GDPR has plenty of different requirements for uh, different countries where, you know, it's 16 in some countries, 13 in others, they'll probably be forced to customize nonetheless. Um, so that's one thing. But enforcement is really, really key. That is um, what I'm really interested in is not so much um, the theoretical rights that you have, whether it's online or offline, but how operational they are in real life for people. How do they experience them? And so, you know, it's like um, going to the police and people filing a little report that goes somewhere and on a shelf and then stays there for 10 years. That's nice. But if that happens in some countries, like you go to the police station, they fill in a paper and then nothing gets done then how, how protected do you feel as a citizen in that case? So enforcement is really essential here. And so sometimes, even though people feel they have certain rights, um, it doesn't always feel like they, they actually have them when they try to exercise them online. And that's not something that is a criticism of a specific uh, service or another. It's just a, 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 point, a fact that uh, both offline and, off, on, and online uh, sometimes between theory and between practice, there is a big gap in terms of the experience. Um, and um, so that's something to be remembered uh, or, or just people that need to be reminded of that when we're talking about citizenship, because it's an important dimension. The, operali the operationalization of certain rights. Um, yeah, I think that that'll be all for me. But really, thanks for your, for your uh, reaction. It was really Thanks a lot. Andrea, do you want to just take us uh, the ICT coalition? Because we have a little question. I think they missed who you work yes. with. So uh, I can, can you just give that. us a little bit more background so they understand the perspective yeah. here? Because so, you've got Martin representing in a sense the voice of the digital citizens and then you've got Andrea more representing the voice of the digital industry. So can you say a bit more about yes, the ICT so coalition? I give it a short version, but sure. around 2011, uh, around 25 companies got together. The idea is to see how they could work to make the internet a safer place. And the first achievement was what we call the ICT principle, which is an vision of how internet should be and could be. Uh, so for those who are interested, ictcoalition.eu, one single word, or you can drop an email to me. Uh, so since then, uh, we've been working uh, closely also with NGO, so Martin is one of our uh, leads, our, our guest, victim, so we could, and uh, solicitors. In terms of we asking, we meet every six months, as I mentioned before, where NGO and civil society are a very important component for us in terms of listening, in terms of presenting their, what we do, because every two years we have a study. So we had three studies so far on different kind of topics from um, how we do it means, uh, and that's my last point, we have ICT principle company every two years, they need to do a self declaration on, on to see how they are implementing this principle. And uh, it's a quite interesting uh, compilation of uh, what kind of different company are doing for uh, protection of minor. So if you're Thanks, interested. Andrea. Thanks for the clarification. And there are members, obviously, of the coalition listening in today. Yes. Um, without quoting names, definitely representatives of the GAFA and ICT industry are, are here listening in. So thank you for joining us. Um, I, can I just one point of what Martin's saying about sure. enforcement? I think it's, sure, then we'll go into the Q&A. Some interesting yeah, stuff going on. Uh, I mean, there's one Q&A, but so people can start to draft more. So enforcement, it's vital. That's why company closely work with uh, local police or with Interpol. And uh, I think, as I said before, there are two, I mean, the problem is also legislation. One is clear, a violation of something like copyright and child protection are, are clearly legal. Uh, one is more the gray zone. When it's not very defined by law, but by values, that's where difficult to lay is. Because it's for companies, sometimes it's difficult to say, okay, it's not illegal, but it's inappropriate who decide what is inappropriate. And last point is also, uh, it's about also the law enforcement. Not many police in Europe can do undercover. 
So it means you cannot solicitate a crime to get a higher crime. Uh, therefore, when it comes to internet and dark web, that's one of the difficulty existing where you need to be able to participate eventually to commit petty crimes as a law enforcement to be able to catch the real bad guys. And this is something where it is not unique legislation. In Europe, we don't have something like FBI. So with crime, going, using server around, that's the difficulties as well. And I stop there. Yeah, lots of points made. I guess one of the Q&A uh, mentions the aspect of knowledge and you raise it as well, Andrea, yes. you know, because when Martin started on blockchain, I think some of us uh, maybe felt uncomfortable because it's not that mm, known in terms of what it does, what it can achieve, uh, the risks, uh, the opportunities. Um, and knowledge is essential, absolutely. Um, there are different ways in which you can uh, get to know more about blockchain and that is already following some of the work of Martin from Cobra Families Europe. But indeed, even before we, we go into blockchain, there are some basics that were mentioned, you know, um, digital skills, for instance. And you mentioned how, I guess you work with, uh, or you encourage work with older persons. There was representative Estelle from Age Platform Europe. They're doing all kinds of work on digital literacy of older persons as well and fake news uh, and other things. Uh, I guess, indeed, digital skills is also another aspect of all of this uh, for, for older persons, but uh, children, also teachers, families. So this is why Coffers of Families Europe works so much on this. As a, well as skills, I just want to say, yes, the setup, the regulatory setup is pretty essential. And as Martin said, of course, it's about operationalizing existing laws. That's the key. But it's also ensuring that the regulator constantly keeps up with the innovation um, in relation to the digital industry so that we can ensure that no one is excluded because I think that's another point that was raised. So that's a kind of general shout out to Alice who said something about, you know, if you look at the Q&A, you can all follow it, I think. Is that correct, Isabel? Can everyone follow the Q&A? So I'm going in, diving in, there's different things going on between different people. Um, but one thing that was mentioned was this, uh, access to knowledge. And this is obviously crucial, I think, if we want to build the digital citizens of the future. Uh, we have also uh, a question from Aria from the European Parents Association. Would, should we not be talking more about clients, consumers, rather than citizens or subjects? Uh, Martin, I don't know, you gave an answer to this. Do you want to elaborate a little on that point? It is a fair question, yeah, so, you know, so, it's the private yeah, space, so, uh, right? So Exactly. So, so uh, basically, uh, uh, she's absolutely right. I mean, um, mostly when you, when you, for instance, form a contract with a private business um, in, 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 uh, in your country, you are a client. You're not, um, uh, you're not a citizen of that <laughs> service. When you go to McDonald's, you're not a citizen of McDonald's. Um, but uh, because some online spaces have become so vital uh, and have a, a general interest in public dimension, uh, general interest dimension, uh, then it's not just being a client of uh, those online services. Besides, there's also a gray zone, which I've been denouncing um, for a long time, where um, you subscribe to these free services. So you're not considered as a consumer you're not a consumer in terms of the, 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 well, now it's been changed because in the revision of the Consumer Rights Directive, I asked specifically that um, people subscribing even to free services, if there is a kind of exchange where they, they sort of let their data being, um, uh, uh, you know, processed and whatever in exchange for uh, accessing the services, they are deemed as a consumer. But there was a real gray zone in terms of when you subscribe to those services and they're free, are you considered a consumer? And do you have the same consumer rights? And uh, when you're a consumer, you have a right to certain redresses if things go wrong. Like for instance, if your package is not delivered on time, you can get refund and all that stuff. But how does it work um, in case, for instance, an online service provider, which you used and is free, loses your data or abuses your data or does something? What is your right to redress? How do you get compensation? I mean, what are you entitled to? Uh, you haven't paid anything. Like if uh, Netflix breaks down, you pay a certain amount of money per month, you can ask for a refund, you can ask for certain compensation, but when it's free, are you really a consumer? And so, you know, there, so 
it, it's not that, so there is this um, commercial dimension is there. So it's, indeed you are a client, but you're more than a client and sometimes not even a client. It's, it's, it's really, there was a real gray zone. So it, it, it really needs to be clarified. And, and again, like I said, because there is a public dimension, public interest dimension in certain of these services, they're so vital. Uh, otherwise, if you cannot access them, you're deemed to be digitally, digitally excluded. This is also why the GDPR uh, didn't just spring uh, into the, 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 the minds of our, of our um, elected representatives as, oh, let's just do GDPR law. We have nothing else to do on our hands. Let's just do GDPR. No, they did it specifically because there were certain online services that were being so big, so important, so vital for the, the, the inclusion and being included in society that they needed to be sort of brought into uh, the public interest sphere with a certain number of, of rights that they need to abide by in terms of data protection, in terms of all kinds of other things. So uh, maybe, i sorry, it's maybe a very confusing answer, but that's because it's, our, our status online is confusing many times. And it's not clear to say whether you're actually a consumer or you're a user or you're a subject or you are a citizen. Um, it's not that clear cut. So we have a gray zone, absolutely. Um, and, and that notion of, yes, it's private space, but when it's so vital to public debate, so this is why we're having the discussion today. So I think that's extremely useful. Thank you very much. Now we have another question from Christian in Croatia. Uh, could we argue that the legitimacy we give to the representatives in the elections by our vote is equal to the one we give by accept accepting the terms and conditions? Political scientists all over the, <laughs> all over the place here. Martin, do you want to elaborate a little bit on what you answered? No, I think I think my answer is pretty straightforward. I I don't think it's comparable, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> even though, even because yeah, because we have a choice in in uh, electing people uh, in a terms and conditions. It's a yes or no. It's uh, either you agree or you disagree. Bye bye. Uh, see you later. Currently, that's the process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that. We have what else do we have? I'm just going down. I don't know if you can see. So. I see one about data protection in your country. So, yeah, so this, I'm, I'm looking at the q and I'm looking at the chat. Yeah, do you want to take okay. that one, Andrea? So yes, I mean, of course, there is data protection, the e-privacy uh, e directive of 2002. So uh, when it comes to electronic communication, so each country in Europe had to implement the directive and actually, so there, there is. Uh, also, there's one about schools, distance and data. One point is also about motivation and skills, but not only for students, also for teachers. I see in case of my kid, they, they replicate the classroom with 22 kids in front of a camera speaking simultaneously. So most of these class, virtual class, is a mess, uh, to be honest, because they try to, repli they're trying to replicate the, mo the same model that you have in a real class in a virtual class. Instead of muting all the kids, as normally I suggest, you have kids trying to speak of each other, and this is despite the very great intention of the teacher. So sometimes some of the teachers never had to, they were not trained to use a, a video system conference to teach. The teaching models are totally different. Also the way of you do homework, because now I see my kids as a piece of paper and to show the, in front of the camera that they did homework, which is, uh, I mean, it's trying to replicate the same things. So, and, the lady is concerned about data protection and use of personal information. Data protection, and Martin mentioned, but one is about GDPR. Uh, clearly, some of the video conference system, and I don't mention once, had serious problem because they have server in China, so it was access about data. They had a problem of porn pornographic pictures which were passing by. Uh, so it's security, safety, data breach, all of them together. Uh, there are the risks, yes. I mean, nothing is 100% safe, but uh, I mean, one thing is also trying to balance what you risk. It's the name of your child and his or her feature. For me, I don't see many problems if someone sees that, to be honest, or if a hacks in the class. I would be much more concerned if they hack uh, the local uh, town hall where there are all more serious data. And that's what I trust public authority to keep safe. Uh, also, company in case of data breach, they have an obligation to report in nowadays because of thanks to GDPR. But definitely, if teachers are expected to be fully, it's a lot. It's 
it's a huge, I mean, for them it's not easy because from, the, from no, one day to training. another. They need the yeah. training. They need to be full-blown full digital citizenship, yeah. citizens to, to assess the and opportunities. Also the world, I mean, nowadays you have digital skills, digital literacy, digital media, which helps people in Korea to, to have a fake news. So you have different layers. And it's not granted that a person has been trained for that. No. So that's also difficulty. I think, as I said before, it's one consideration that our society needs to think about the cost post COVID-19. If it's true that we have a second wave of virus coming and lockdown maybe next fall, if it's true, uh, what are we going to do to be sure that, for instance, teachers or are able to, I mean, between all the other categories as well, uh, are able to support and they are given the proper tools to do their job of educators, for instance. And uh, you know, also, uh, maybe be cheeky, but parents uh, working at home with school, with kids without schools, it's tough for everybody. Yeah. And I mean, I was complaining. I had to print 165 pages of bricolage for Easter for my kid. And I got in trouble because I was not cutting well. But it means I couldn't do anything else. And it's not that I don't want to. But if I do that, I don't work. So we need to also try to see how we, as a society, collectively, we change things we do it. Sure. I just want a question of clarification. Charlene, what, what country are you from? Because uh, in the EU, indeed, we have the EU GDPR, in fact, which has to um, be insured in all the EU countries, at least. Uh, so the, the, I wonder if you're from another part of the world. Or, ah, okay, Philippines. Aha, uh -huh, okay, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so this is quite a major thing driven by Europe. And, uh, Not yet the member state. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> uh, not yet, but it's great to have you here. Um, I, but we can send you more information about the, the European legislation, if you want, the GDPR. Uh, which e privacy. I think she was asking also about uh, privacy. I think it was also about privacy. Oh, it's data privacy. privacy okay, also. So it's the privacy 2002. Oh, because even before then, way before then. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. That's why it's a bit obsolete. I well, see, I see. That's what part of people claim. Yeah, so there is it's quite under a revision. regulation here in Europe, at least, uh, which obviously has an impact uh, on other world regions, uh, especially the, the US, um, since they're big providers. I don't know, before, before Martin, maybe you take the question on open source, I wonder, Andrea, if you have, or, or either of you, could you recommend any resources for teachers? Um, obviously, eTwinning is fantastic. And yes, eTwinning, the school net, they have yeah. amazing stuff. I yeah. think it's one of the best in Brussels comes to my mind. Uh, but we'll, we'll think of some well, I'll, 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 advertise, I'll advertise the Council of Europe, of course. They've yeah. developed Council many resources and they're yeah. in the process of yeah. developing many resources for teachers what on we can digital do citizenship. Maybe... They already have a booklet. They already have a booklet on uh, internet, uh, online safety and internet, um, on the internet uh, that, that I've actually co-written with um, Elizabeth and uh, Janice. So, I mean, there are plenty of resources, yes, from Council the Council of Europe. Council of Europe is really top as well, yeah. So we will think and maybe post some, some examples uh, uh, on our website after. Uh, do you want to take the question about open source, Martin? Yeah, so the question, let me find it. It's um, <clears throat> why aren't open source services encouraged on a public state level? Couldn't they be safer for schools? Well, <laughs> be nice. There's, there's, there's a tough question. No, I mean, the, the short answer, cynical answer is that uh, it's a huge market. Uh, it's uh, millions of euros actually uh, to buy to buy licenses for you know Microsoft or whatever, and uh, and uh, you know uh, have these group licenses. It's big business. Um, it, it's millions of, of dollars and euros, um, and that's that's one part of the answer. The second part of the answer is that um, there is uh, a very it's very political actually, and it's very difficult because. The reality is when you have a near monopoly, and by the way, Microsoft was, um, I think, convicted in 99 and by the US of being, a, 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 what is it, um, anti, antitrust, um, of being a monopoly. When you have 90% of the world computers that run uh, Microsoft Office and uh, Windows, then um, the real world is, if you want to prepare your young people for um, uh, having the right skills to be able to you know, start um, uh, you know, typing documents, making presentations and all that stuff, then, you know, you have to prepare them for, for the office suite and for Windows because most computers are running that. On the other hand, um, 
where's the market? Where's competition? Um, and what is your role in the state in promoting diversity in a market and making sure that you don't have monopolies setting in? And so there, I mean, my, my position is that we should have both. We should really have uh, an education system which um, shows all of the alternatives that exist, shows that one of them costs money and are license-based, others are free, and um, you know, have a course on Photoshop, have a for course on GIMP, have a fo uh, course on uh, Microsoft Word, but also show open office. Um, and so don't, like really to have a broad spectrum to make sure that uh, the, 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 the students have a real um, uh, or a sort of a broader spectrum of what's available. Um, and uh, then making a choice when they decide uh, what they want to install on their computer. Uh, have a more realistic kind of choice than just say, okay, this is all there is. Um, and so obviously there's a commercial dimension to, to um, those digital skills. Uh, it's very political. What digital skills? For what software? For what uh, ser services? Um, so that cannot be just, just, uh, just uh, brushed under the table. Uh, it has to be addressed. And, um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's a big can of worms. Um, yeah, I think... We've had a few comments in the chat, and I think already quite a lot is available um, online through the big portal that we'll hear about on Wednesday with June and Carl and uh, eTwinning later on this week. And so it's true that the open source is, is um, yeah, a matter for consideration, absolutely. Um, but I think there is a world of information out there that loads of people aren't aware of. And I think if we can help take that to you in the next 10 days, uh, we'll be very happy to, to facilitate that. On the parents' uh, comment, yes, absolutely. It's like lifelong learning for parents. You know, we're clueless in many ways. We're doing our best. It's so challenging. Um, and already lots of Cofase Families Europe members have all kinds of parental support programs, like uh, Isadora Duncan in Spain. They try to support uh, more vulnerable families to really... Um, be fully digitally, digitally included. They do great work. And in fact, Daniel, I think, posted something about it just there. Um, Kizinspond and Ligue des Familles in Belgium have a great web ethics uh, training uh, for parents to, to you know, explore that world as parents. So it's, it's definitely something, you know, family environment is definitely for us, obviously, a key layer of building that famous uh, digital citizenship. So I wanted to put that, that in there. Um, I'm just looking, Isabel, have, how, do we have anything else we want to take out of the uh, chat? Someone just uh, commented uh, saying, uh, I'm Frida from Finland. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. everyone can read it. Um, it so Finnish just volunteer. Ah, yeah, so peer to peer, that's kind of nice. Okay, of course, but youth is a massive target, uh, of course. Uh, they, are they natural citizens, digital citizens? We'll find out on the 20th of May with Big Youth directly. Uh, but it's true that peer-to-peer -peer is, is fantastic and they're doing great stuff there. Um, I'm taking a look. I know it's not like this. Everywhere. I think also the European Commission does a lot. Unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately, I should not say that, but the people doing this are based in Luxembourg. So from Brussels' perspective, they're a bit hidden. But in terms of e-learning and child safety, I think they have a quite a lot of information available as well. Yeah, and about the market being overwhelmed, I think, how do we strike the balance? You know, we, we need to let the economy thrive to a certain extent, but you know, it's about finding a balance between um, letting the private, private space do what it does best, but also thinking about the general interest. And so making this digital Europe work for society first and foremost. So it's, how do we strike that balance? It's, I guess it's something we need to consider. Um, I, mean, I wanted to think as a citizen, we, as a consumer and user, we have the power to stop using certain services. Oh yeah, we can, so, we can move markets uh, as consumers. I Martin will disagree on me on that because I disagree. <laughs> think, yeah, of course, they are become so relevant and I, don't, yes. I stress relevant, not predominant, uh, that you may feel excluded. But in the end of the day, the fact they work well, uh, and the fact that they are big doesn't mean they are dominant. They need to be sure that they comply with the legislations. We need to be sure that they respect certain values, uh, which are those values of the country. And again, the difficulty is that in Europe, we have a, in terms of uh, legislation giving values, which give, uh, uh, they are embedded in the legislation are quite different. 
And that's why I always prefer when the commission does a regulation more than a directive. So that it's a uniformity around the, across the uh, continent. Uh, but in the end of the day, it's our our choice. I mean, it's uh, it's true that Martin make a, make a distinction before. As a consumer, you don't pay, but you provide data, uh, and it's never it's never free lunch, uh, in one way or another. The problematic is what the data is used for uh, nowadays, and what happens when the bad guy uses it. How you can redress? How you can protect yourself when the bad guys get hold of your data? I think that's also quite important. It be and it goes back to the point of enforcement. Yes. The two things I wanted to mention is, of course, the network effect, which uh, Andrea said uh, under the that services are very relevant. The fact that basically when everybody's on a service, then if you're not on it, uh, it it's kind of a de facto self-exclusion. But that's just uh, the way that, that uh, these services function. What I've been kind of uh, denouncing uh, at EU level, I'm sure Andrea's uh, heard this before, is that these new online services um, have not... Uh, emulated the features of email. That is email, regardless of the client that you subscribe to, you can send emails to any other client. So it is a sort of harmonized or interoperable service. And you can easily move from one to another. If you're not happy with your uh, email provider and they're snooping into your emails too much, you can just uh, move on to another one and you can still email all of your other contacts. But that doesn't work if you're on a social network. If you leave that social network, you cannot interact with the people in that social network anymore. Now, of course, making them interoperable is a huge, huge um, discussion and you know there's many technical obstacles to be tackled I don't think they're uh, not possible to be overcome um, but it, re it will require work for sure I just think that certain uh, certain rights in the GDPR are st and heading into that direction anyway it's like for instance data portability for instance I take the radical view that data portability in the end can be interpreted as people hosting their own data and then allowing different services access to that data instead of just moving their data around from service to service, which would be much more convenient. So you ne your data never moves or it moves in bulk. You just uh, pick a cloud service, for instance, and then you allow certain services to connect to that uh, and use that data or access parts of that data. And if you're not happy, you just uh, shut the door closed and open access to another um, uh, provider. But that would require interoperability. I mean, uh, if, I don't want to go into the technical details, but I know how Facebook sort of structures the data because I've, I've programmed an app that uses uh, uh, Facebook to post things. So, you know, they have, they're using standard database, um, um, standard database language, uh, like JSON, like, uh, you know, so, I mean, it, it's not impossible. It's just that it, it will require some, some uh, thinking. Thanks, Martin. I want to come back on a question from Joao. He mentioned first and so, or one of you mentioned first and second class citizenship and how many can be very much excluded from this digital reality and citizenship. Um, so the question is how to assume, find, pursue, uh, pursue a neutral ground of shared rights. And I think it comes back in a sense to what Andrea was saying about European leadership in that sense. So the, the education systems are very different and how we tackle and support families are very different. Um, but, and I come back to the message of the executive vice president this morning in terms of all the different layers they're looking at, the Digital Services uh, Act, the, um, the Digital Education Action Plans. So I think Europe clearly, in my mind at least, and for Copacy Families Europe, has a role in terms of coordinating or understanding the different realities and, and trying to provide that famous neutral ground? I don't know, what do you think? Uh, if, I mean, if a dare can make a point, it's take an average of family nowadays. They need to pay, I don't know, 30, 40 euro per month for a broadband subscription at home. Then you start to have many, many services which are gated, so you need to pay for it. A newspaper, entertainment, content. So my worry is that you are going to create two, uh, you're going to have people who don't have access anymore to quality information because you're going to protect it by subscription fee. So how you protect people from the spreading of fake news or misinformation because those who are going to want to spread news, they want to, sorry, spread fake news, they are not going to ask for money. They will just give information accessible to everybody. Uh, so the also the possibility, as I said before, if you live in a remote rural area, where there is no connection, again, you are excluded as well. Uh, 
therefore, I mean, the union, I mean, this is again discussion for the commission. I'm sure there's been a lot of discussion about it, about the obligation for a telecom provider to cover regions which are not also economic viable. Because if we reason in terms of we put 5G or 4G or satellite coverage only where it makes sense and money, again, uh, also I think, but this is my impression, because of COVID-19, many people will leave cities. Maybe we're trying to go outside towns and have a sort of more pleasant life and to be confined. Uh, last point, someone, a gentleman, I think mentioned in safe, in, in safe and hope, they are great project. And if I put my lobbyist hat, I will say to everybody on the call, now the commission, I think in two weeks, will present a new budget, but it's a member state to approve. So each, uh, each of us need to go and knock the door to our national representative, because it will be the national ministers approving or not the budget to be sure that there is enough budget for the commission to keep uh, these initiatives going on. And I think it's something that in each one of us can do it, but there is no point in going and banging the door to the commission in this case, because I'm sure the commission will take care of it. It's going and banging the door of our ministers and uh, national representative because they would be themselves deciding for it. Thanks, Andrea. I see one last thing I want to mention uh, from Ricardo. <laughs> would it be too naive to promote an EU basic digital citizenship? Hmm. So, yes. I mean, I it would be great. I would love it. For me, it would be fantastic. And if I have a European an ID with the chief, I will go for it. Unfortunately, it's a member state. Uh, I mean, make, let me make an example, Ricardo. We have been speaking about this traceability app for uh, COVID-19. There is not one single approach in Europe for that. So I live in Belgium. You have a, point. You have a serious yeah. point there, yeah. I, I mean, I live in Belgium and they think the app is intrusive. So you have 2,000 people working in a call center. All of them have an access to our data. So don't speak about privacy there. And now you start to have, yes, the police informing people that there are data thief pretending to be the call center, calling people to say, one of your friends got COVID-19. In Italy, they have, they web, the uh, app will be launched in two weeks. In Germany and France, they are launching where France is going to have health authority controlling the data and in Germany it will be in your device. So the point I'm trying to make that here is that even if we're not able to agree between member states on something so fundamental and relevant as our health and our protected, I fear that they would never get close to any agreement in terms of how we can join collectively services. But for me, Ricardo, I will go for it. Okay, thanks. Uh, Martin, I wonder, well, we have a, I'm going to take one last question here from our president, actually, and we just can, should we focus more on meta? I guess, are you trying to say that, well, we, we are prosumers, we can move markets, we can help decide the space that we, you know, function in, the digital space, um, because we not only consume, but we, we produce, we, content. We produce yeah. content, right? Um, should 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 we do further? Um, should we try to activate this shaping, um, which would be part of a digital so citizenship? It's actually linked to that question about first class, second class citizens, and having a sort of a standard for everyone to <clears throat> to enjoy right? online. It's it's really linked to that. So, um, what I answered there is that. Um, I really think that that digital citizenship education, whether it's done by uh, the Council of Europe or the Big Network or anyone, anyone, anybody else or us, for instance, the aim, I think, is for citizens to have a sort of an expectation for what standards they should expect uh, in terms of their digital citizenship and their experience online so that they can make more informed choices, definitely. Uh, and thereby shape, you know, the online world. So if, for instance, they know about their rights to active participation, they know about their rights to data protection, they know about all of these things, and then they see that certain services, on certain services they cannot find even half of those, then uh, it may be interesting then to have people that are informed like that um, um, move their content around or, or pick different services. Of course, there are preconditions for that uh, to facilitate that kind of thing. Like, you know, like mobile phone uh, number switching, for instance, um, required a certain sets of regulations to enable those kind of things. And that comes back to what I was saying before about moving your data and the fact that these services are not interoperable. That all, that also is, is a kind of a, uh, a barrier. Um, but 
the reason why I think uh, digital citizenship education is so important is because, uh, and that's linked to my last slide on my presentation, if we are moving towards a world where decentralized uh, services become more and more available, then it will be depending on um, users themselves, people themselves, to pick uh, the services that um, are most responsible, have the best governance uh, features, uh, and that, that will determine their, their experience online. If they take a hands-off approach and they just go for whatever is popular or whatever, then it'll be up to the developers of those decentralized services that will make all the calls, all the, they will call all the shots that will decide all the features that you'll have. And maybe there's certain they'll be missing and there's nothing probably or very little that your governments will be able to do about that at that stage, which is why it's so important for people to uh, have a sort of a, a list in their heads of all the things that they should look into when they decide to support uh, a service. Like, uh, does it enable me to participate? Does it enable me to uh, protect my data? How can I move it around? Does it have data portability? Does it have online safety? Does it have moderation? All of these questions that you should ask yourself when you're joining a service. Um, and, and that's a lot of work, by the way, which is why also I, I'd really like to have standards developed, uh, but we'll see. I mean, that's, there's one part is the education part. The other part is uh, we can imagine, for instance, that public authorities provide seals of approval for uh, certain services that meet certain requirements in terms of uh, the digital citizenship uh, you know, features that they provide. Uh, how good they fare on uh, uh, moderating the content, how, how good they fare on participation of their users. Um, all of that can be done. It's just a lot of lack of resources sometimes and time and, and methodology. But um, I really think that, so those are the two elements of my, of my reply. Great, well, I think we've kind of covered a lot. I don't know how you feel. Um, we have three, four minutes left, so. Wrap up. I, <laughs> Feel like make a point, may I? Yeah, I yeah. you want to make a last point and then we'll, we'll ask is about to wrap up? Yeah, so just yeah. a point about net etiquette. I think it's important to understand that we should start to uh, stop thinking about what is digital, what is real. It's one single thing in terms of behaving. Like you don't stop shouting people on the street, you should not insult people on the internet. Uh, especially, I mean, in my case, I had to do make a transition. I remember I had a room with a computer, it was like zzz, and connected. Uh, nowadays, uh, it's so ubiquitous that we should start to think about why we speak about e-health. Shall we not speak about uh, uh, health the services delivered other in real or digital or, or about e-administration? It's still public administration. So I think it's important to think of, to focus not about simple net etiquette, but about how people behave generally. And that should reflect online, on real world, on televisions. And last point here is no, it's also difficult to explain when you have uh, politicians winning election on blunt lies. I'm thinking about the double deck bus in the UK with 320 million uh, per week back. And, but if that things would have been in the internet, people would have been crucified the company publishing because of misinformation. In this case, it was a beautiful double deck uh, traveling through London and it was a blunt lie. So. And that's why it's very difficult to explain to people you need to behave, you need to be proper when you have such a simple, and it's a simplification, this one, huh? Can I, can I just quickly come in? I just wanted to say uh, thanks everyone for listening in. Okay. Just to say that tomorrow we have an awesome session on video games, which will be very hands-on. So I don't miss uh, this tune in, it, it will be really cool. And uh, Wednesday we have the commission on, so they'll be informing us about the European strategy. Uh, for better internet for children. So really interesting sessions and then we'll have further sessions down the line But I just wanted to make sure that you tune in because it will be really cool Yes, and also thank you to the speakers for sharing their knowledge with all of us and uh, Yes, <laughs> and uh, like Martin said tune in uh, We have really great topics. You just need to use the same link as you already did for this one today and For we will also provide the recording for this webinar just uh, yeah, follow our social media or monitor our website. We will let you know, know there when it is available. And uh, yeah, like Martin said, tomorrow is video games. Don't miss that. And also, if you want to, maybe you don't have time for one and a half hours, but you still want to know what's going on, you can still see it on our Twitter a bit and follow the hashtag uh, DigitalFamiliesEU. 
So uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it and have a great rest of the day. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. 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 See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, some of you.